Welcome to the first global EdTech Summit that we've done. I'm David Linky, the Managing Director of EdGrowth, Australia's Education Technology Innovation Industry Hub. Through connection and collaboration, we accelerate Australia's EdTech ecosystem globally. Thanks for coming along today. Today's event is being simulcast in English and Mandarin. So before we begin, Ms. Cherry, Cherry Chi from Treasury New South Wales will join us to explain how to access the Mandarin translation of the conference via the Interpretify, Interpretify platform. Welcome, Cherry. Summit2021，并点击Connect即可。Please show mobile app slide. 您可以通过屏幕下方使用指南来连接。第二种方式是通过浏览器接入Interpify。点击屏幕下方的链接并选择语言即可。Please show the web browser slide, please. 屏幕下方也将有使用指南可供参考。当您使用浏览器接入Interpify时，请将后的音频设置为静音。为取得最佳的效果，建议您使用两台设备，一台登录Home Link 为本次大会，我们还建建组建了一个微信群，欢迎扫描屏幕下方二维码入群交流。Please show the QR codes. 现在将舞台交还给主持人 David Knight. Hand over back to you. Thanks. Thanks very much, Cherry. I appreciate and welcome everybody who's joining us from China today using the Interprefy app. As we begin our session, allow me to pause to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land upon which we all gather. For our non-Australian attendees today, we, let me briefly explain. At the beginning of formal meetings like this in Australia, we pause to pay our respects to traditional owners of the land. We do this to acknowledge their continuous and unbroken custodianship of the land we call Australia as a mark of respect to their elders past, present and emerging. As we gather today physically dispersed but virtually connected, I acknowledge the traditional owners of Australia and recognise their continuous and unbroken connection to the land, waters and culture of the country. Today I personally join you from the traditional land of the Buwarong and the Woiwurrung people of the Kulin Nations. And I extend all our respect to their elders past, present and emerging all of uh, in all of Australia, including from where you are joining us today. On behalf of Treasury New South Wales, our partners in today's summit, I extend my respects to traditional owners of Sydney, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nations. And finally, I specifically extend my respects to the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people with us present today. Very briefly, Edge of Growth exists because Charles Sturt, Deakin, Griffith, Latrobe and Monash Universities and Navitas believed that Australia can be central to the digital transformation of education here and around the world. These organisations founded Edge Growth in 2016 and today we have hundreds of members connected into our programs. On behalf of all our members, I thank our founding partners for their ongoing support. Today's summit, we're going to meet an incredible group of New South Wales EdTech companies who will showcase their innovative and proven EdTech solutions. We'll then hear from Professor Shirley Alexander, the Deputy Vice-Chancellor of Education at the prestigious University of Technology, Sydney. Professor Alexander will share the UTS journey to reimagine the student experience in an ever-changing world. She will be joined in conversation by Adam Brimo, the group CEO of Open Learning for a Q&A session. A program like this is only possible with partners. New South Wales Treasury has been a fantastic partner to ensure we can showcase these exciting New South Wales EdTech companies to a Chinese audience. Please welcome Murray Davis, the Trade Commissioner for China at New South Wales Treasury, who will officially open the Global Summit. Hi Murray, how are you? Yeah. 
I can hear you perfectly. All right. Thank you for that introduction and uh, welcome to everybody who's uh, joined in today, both in China and in Australia. Uh, my name is Murray Davis. I'm the New South Wales uh, State Government Trade and Investment Commissioner based in China. I'm speaking to you today from Shanghai. Uh, and it's my great pleasure to be here to just give a few opening remarks um, before we uh, kick off with some introductions to the um, companies that we're here to showcase today. Um, in this few minutes that I have been allocated, what I would like to do is to try to give a little bit of uh, context to where New South Wales sits in its relationship with China. Uh, what are the key sort of elements of that relationship? How has it been affected by the disruptions of the last 12 months? And you know, what sorts of new directions do we think that we can uh, explore? Um, the disruptions in 2020 were so profound and so uh, deep that I think the uh, it's still too early to assess exactly what the um, detailed implications were. I think we need to wait a few more months before we'll have the, the figures come in uh, that, that we can do that. So what I'd like to do is to just give you a very quick recap of where things got up to with New South Wales's relationships in China up until the end of 2019, which is uh, the period of time where we have, uh, you know, pretty robust data. Um, and the, 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 the conclusions that one draws from that are that New South Wales was deeply integrated with, uh, with China. So running through the key elements of that relationship, I can say that in 2019, um, New South Wales foreign exchange earnings from China were 26 billion Australian dollars, um, which is by far the biggest uh, of any country. China would be our largest um, trading partner in that broad sense. Breaking that down a little more, and we can look at the merchandise trade, uh, you know, trade in actual goods. New South Wales exported um, about $14 billion, um, which was the actually the second largest export destination. Our largest market is actually Japan. But in two-way trade terms, China is by far our largest trading partner. We imported about $45 billion Australian dollars worth of goods from China in 2019, and we exported um, about $14 billion um, in that period. No. We, we had um, about another almost $5 billion in foreign exchange earnings from tourists. Uh, the tourism numbers from China were large, they were growing, and the tourists that used to come to Australia stayed longer, they spent more, they were more adventurous, they went to more places than other tourists. They were just, they were just the most wonderful sort of cohort for the Australian um, tourism industry. As I said, about $4.7 billion in 2019 in tourism. Um, New South Wales was also the largest uh, destination for investment. So over the last five years, there were something like uh, $45 billion invested in Australia. About half of that went into New South Wales. Um, there was a further uh, export of about uh, 1.2, 1.3 billion in export of services. Um, so for things like uh, transport, insurance, telecommunications, um, these sorts of things, and then another couple of billion dollars there. So when you add it all up, you see a very, very broad and deep engagement that New South Wales had with, with, with Greater China. With all of the disruptions that have taken place in the last 12 months, many of those numbers will not be the same uh, when it all comes in from 2020. Merchandise trade will still be important, but I think it will definitely have been affected, not just by some of the uh, trade disputes that we've seen in the, in the media, but also by the lack of freight uh, that's available, lack of demand uh, in China, because China has experienced some d demand side disruptions because of COVID, um, and also because of supply side issues in Australia around droughts and floods and fires and other, other things. Um, the thing that I think we're going to focus in on today is international education. Now, China was our largest source of international students. 
um, there was a figure of about five billion dollars that New South Wales could depend on from Chinese students in Australia. That, of course, is now um, has to be revised downwards quite significantly. Um, certainly for last year, almost certainly for this year. And the education industry in Australia has really got to find new ways, new modalities with which to engage with our major partners, such as China. And I think that this is where we can hone in on the topic today, which is um, leveraging new technologies, innovative technologies in a way to deliver education when it's no longer possible to, to travel in person. So we have seven companies today who are all based in New South Wales. Uh, who I think you will agree when you hear them are genuinely global in their vision. Um, they're they're world-class in their technology and um, they bring a level of sophistication and um, uh, smarts to the relationship, which I think is really um, needed at this time. So I'm delighted to be here. I acknowledge um, the assistance that we've had from uh, 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 David's um, edgy growth. Um, also from the Australian Trade Commission, who has assisted us um, greatly. Um, I wish everybody uh, a fruitful discussion today. And with that, I'll hand back to you, David. Thank you. Thanks so very much, Murray, for setting the context of the trade relationship between uh, Australia, New South Wales and the Chinese market. We're now going to hear from some really exciting New South Wales EdTech companies. So we're going to hear from Alex Burke from Education Perfect, who will then be followed by Mark Stanley from Literatu, and we'll conclude with Sheree Diaz from Open Learning. So Alex, I think you're with us. Hi Alex, how's Hi, it David. going? Very well, thank you, David. How are you? I think good, good. I think we've got your screen share there for you as well. We'll get that up. Okay, great. We'll leave you to it. Okay, have fun. Fantastic. Thank you very much. And um, firstly, um, it's great to kick off today uh, and showcase some of the great Australian uh, businesses. Um, thanks so much to Murray, New South Wales government, and also David Edgegrowth um, for the invitation. Um, so Education Perfect, uh, as, a, as an industry, as you'd probably know, uh, off the back of COVID, last year, many, many uh, schools, uh, teachers, uh, students were kind of disrupted uh, from uh, the normal way that we run schools. Uh, and many were challenged um, over the course of the year. And I think um, one of the most important things when you think about sort of transformations is that uh, the education industry definitely is gonna go through a digital transformation and it's really important that the industry looks to see where technology can uh, help and enhance uh, the teacher and the learning experience for students. So Education Perfect, uh, we've been going now for 13 years. Uh, we are a complete digital teaching and learning toolkit um, for what we say is the 21st century, the modern era. Uh, I guess, the future of education. What we have as a technology is firstly a toolkit, a set of world-class tools to uh, allow for learning and revision and assessment. Our technology uh, is focused on schools, so years five to 12. So that's sort of from 10 years old up. And education is pretty unique in that we offer all subject areas for a school, so covering all core subjects. We use data to uh, empower teachers, save them time. And we also use data in our platform to help personalize learning experiences uh, for students, um, differentiate uh, the classroom, and really help uh, student engagement and student progression, working hand in hand uh, in the classroom. We have uh, sitting on top of our technology, our toolkit and our data set, we then have a rich library of curriculum aligned content. Uh, this is being built internally by ourselves, but also we have authoring tools which allow uh, teachers to customize it for their for their school, 
uh, for their location and they can also create lessons themselves which has been a really big thing for us over COVID with over 30% of teachers in our platform actually creating lessons from scratch. As a technology business, we tick all the boxes around accessibility, security, and our product is um, currently working in, in China uh, through the various firewalls. We're currently trusted and I'm pleased to say ever evolving and ever growing uh, by over 3000 schools, over a million students, we have over 50,000 teachers using the platform and we're now in over 80 countries around the world. And we have very, very strong customer advocacy with over 6,000 positive reviews in the last 12 months. We're currently already in the region. We're working with international schools primarily in Hong Kong. Here are uh, a list of um, some of the schools that we're uh, currently working with and hopefully some of these uh, brand and uh, school logos you will recognize. And in, in broader China, um, again, working with a whole mix of size of schools um, across many, many, many regions in China. Our mission is humanizing technology for lifelong learning. We believe that um, technology needs uh, uh, humans to uh, bring it alive, but also we understand that within school communities, um, they're still at really the early stage of digital transformation. And it's very, very important when you're launching technology that you have that human support. And we have a, um, a dedicated teacher consultant um, who's just joined EP, uh, Brian Oshiro, who's uh, worked in China for, for over 10 years. Um, and he'll be in the region to help um, support the rollout of our product. Alex, thanks so very much. I really appreciate that introduction to Education Perfect. That's a great intro. Thanks very much. Um, we're going to move David. on to Mark Stanley from Literatu now. So, Mark, I think you're with us. Yes, good morning, everybody. Share yeah. your screen as well, Mark, and we'll make sure I'll get sure that you, we can see it and hear you. We can hear you and we can see you. Okay, you got that screen? We've got your screen. All right, over okay. to you. Good morning. I am, as David said, Mark Stanley. I'm uh, presenting Scribo this morning, which is our global AI platform for building English writing schools, skills. So, so Scribo at the moment uh, helps over 300,000 uh, students and 4,000 teachers across a range of colleges to improve English writing skills. You know, and we do this through uh, delivering artificial intelligence and machine learning capability into education domains. So it's all about personalizing each student's learning. Uh, we coordinate all of our regional activity and partners from our research center and partner center in Hong Kong, sorry, in Singapore. And we've just finished a whole bunch of research with leading academics in Singapore about how to use AI to improve learning. So we're looking to, uh, to grow across Asia and certainly to meet great partners in China. So these are the challenges that, that uh, schools ask us to fix, ask us to get involved in. You know, how do we increase teacher scale? You know, there's over a billion students learning English most of them in lockdown. So how do you connect to them, add value to them, stay relevant to them? And, you know, English writing is the most difficult skill to master. It's the most expensive for schools to actually teach and resource as well. So schools say, how do we increase service levels without incrementing cost? And then how do we, you know, schools are always saying, how do we innovate in the English writing support with technology when, you know, artificial intelligence and machine learning is not our core business. So this is what we deliver. You know, three things, really time, feedback and data. And time is money. So time savings for teachers and students save money and increase service capabilities for colleges. Uh, our APIs open up branding and workflow so we integrate really nicely. Our students all everywhere, teachers everywhere, love our personalised feedback. It's, it's age appropriate, it's targeted to your level of ability and it's at scale and anytime you like as well. And of course, data is the anchor point of everything we do. You cannot uh, run artificial intelligence and machine learning without great data and we make that visible. So I just want to quickly walk you through how a college uses something like Scribo in a headless Microsoft Teams environment, um, you know, SSO, 
everything linked up. So students will have a practice library that they can very quickly and easily get to, and they'll select a topic to write to. So on the left side, we've got our writing support environment, and on the right side is where students contribute their text. This is what they want to uh, see how they're going. So our feedback is instant. It's paragraph sentence level. It's, it's completely personalized by artificial intelligence. It talks about where you're long, where you're short. It's color coded, red, orange, green. And it can be translated into the local dialect of the student, which is a big bonus for students who are nascent writers. You know, we do so much more than grammar, punctuation and spelling. Uh, we see that as a minimum. We actually come across 10 levels of analysis in our writing, and that's what students really enjoy. Um, our text to speech componentry and the way that we do this improves um, vocabulary, all sorts of ways of writing for students, and that's multilingual as well. The best part is the scoring. They love getting a score at the end of their working um, experience. Um, where did I sit? Where did I go? How do I get better? That's the thing that makes the difference really. And that's all automatic. Teachers can also connect into the system. Um, our teacher perspective is a live learning environment where teachers can manage many hundreds of students looking for risk, looking for opportunities to contribute feedback into the mix. And that is a big bonus for teachers to add value. Of course, data is always available across many different metrics of writing. And, um, you know, the whole product is very well run in. So I would invite you to join us with our in our virtual trade booth um, just after these sessions. Our contacts are there. And I want to thank you for your time and say good morning to you and hand back to David, who will introduce you to Sherry from Open Learning. Good morning to you. Mark, thanks so very much. It's uh, really great to hear how Scribo's developing and where it's going. So thanks very much for being with us. And a great introduction. We have Cherie Diaz from Open Learning with us. Hi, Cherie. Cherie, I can see you. I can't hear you, though. I can't hear you. I still can't hear you. I'm sorry. Let's try again. There we go. Is that better? Yeah, now we can hear you. There Fantastic. We go. Have you got your screen shared there with your presentation? You should have. Is it up now? All right. There we go. Well, now we can see it. Yeah. All right. So we can see it. We can hear you. We can uh, see your presentation. Off you go. Awesome. Thanks, David. Hi, everyone. My name is Sheree Diaz. I'm the Managing Director of Australia Open Learning. I've been with the organisation for about two and a half years now, but we were founded in 2012 and we're head office in Sydney and we listed on the stock exchange at the end of 2019. To date, we've grown to just over 2.6 million learners globally. Uh, we do have learners across 165 countries and we also have a regional office based in Malaysia and our customer success team is global uh, with offices or personnel based around the globe who support both our learners and our education um, providers using the platform as well. To date or at this point in time, we've got about 4,000 active courses running on the platform and are enabling more than 140 education providers in delivering a range of programs, everything from MOOCs or tasters, micro-credentials, professional development right through to postgraduate qualifications. The difference with open learning is we're not a learning management system. We're a next generation platform that is enabling education providers, regardless of their status or type, to deliver transformative education. We do this through a different approach to how the platform has been designed. It's research backed, founded on a social constructive learning philosophy and science, which puts at the center the learning experience and really is focused on having an outcomes based education approach. The end result is that regardless of the type of program or the locations that it's being delivered from, the student engagement and experience is heightened through constructive activities, more engagement with their peers for co-constructing of knowledge and activities that they can complete. But it's also built on the fact that it automatically generates a portfolio of their learning for them, being a lifelong learning platform which makes it easier for them to be able to demonstrate their outcomes and competency, whether that's for a job application, career advancement, or continuing their education experience. We've also developed and implemented an interoperable micro-credential framework to support our education providers in moving into micro-credentials as that gains traction. That's supported by digital badges and certificates, which help to extend the reach and recognition of those student outcomes. 
and at its core enables quantitative and qualitative learning analytics as well. One of the other points of differences for open learning is it's not just about accredited education delivery. It enables our education providers, whether they're universities or polytechnics, etc., to deliver their full programs and qualifications via the platform, but also to extend their reach into new markets through our marketplace so that they can gain new students, whether that's from our existing database of students or access further learners who are looking for new programs on an ongoing basis. On your screen now, you can see that we've got a range of partners who are using our platform at the moment, and it extends beyond our university or um, polytechnics or you know, training organizations, right through to government departments or school providers as well. In 2020, we did, we, the platform was already accessible in China, but we also entered into a relationship with Alibaba to strengthen that connectivity as well and assure that the students who are studying in China have a sound and high speed access to the platform. As I mentioned earlier, we've also introduced a, a micro credential framework called Open Creds. What it's been designed to foster is an interoperable system or capability for the range of education providers to enter into micro credentials with a structure that supports high quality micro credential development and delivery, as well as for learners to understand what opportunities micro credentials <coughs> offer to them. In the trade booth, I'll be able to walk through a range of different ways that we've been able to support our partners and look forward to talking to you then. Thanks, David. Thanks very much, Cherie. It's fantastic to gain here an update on where open learning is going and all of the work that you're doing, especially with Chinese uh, uh, market entry as well. So fantastic. We now have um, Nadan Katith from Class 365, who will then be followed by Adam MacArthur from Pascal Press, Darcy Jamison from Metific, and Peter Wong from Bria. Have you got some uh, slides to share with us, Nandan? Uh, yep. Yeah. Can you see my slide? for them to come up. Yeah, can you see the screen? Not just yet now. Oh, we can. There we go. We've got your screen. We can hear you. We can see you. Off you go. Excellent. Da David, thank you so much. Hello, everyone. Uh, Daja Ho, Hoshi Nandan Keithi. Um, I'm the co-founder of Classy365. Uh, it's an absolute pleasure to present Classy365 in this global summit. And I'm very happy to share uh, the story of Classy365. There was once a time when education and learning was simple. Uh, however, but things have changed uh, and how, you know, over the, over the course of past decade, uh, learning and uh, administration have moved online about other things as well. As a result, students, their needs, compliance, administrative tasks have begun to grow and grow exponentially. Uh, this sadly has created multiple silos of tools and tasks uh, to manage even the simplest functions. This has ultimately made education less about teaching and learning and more about administering multiple tools and software. But just like Sun Tzu says, in the midst of chaos, there's always an opportunity. Uh, so we strongly believed in this and decided to solve the problem related to student administration and learning management. And thus, Class E365 was born. Uh, Class E365 is a complete student administration and learning management platform designed by experienced uh, leaders in technology and education as well. So we created a simple, single unified platform. So education institution can focus on teaching and learning just like what they did before. So why Class E365? Let's look at a, a simple use case, say for example, Lee, Wai, uh, Lee Wai's entire student life cycle, starting from enrollment up until he becomes an alumni. So if you look at this slide, um, you know, uh, let's say you are an education institution trying to get new students. You can get online application forms uh, using our platform. And from there, you can capture leads and ap applications directly online. With just one click, you can do the enrollment, manage the pre-admissions pre as well. So we have a student information system um, that includes you know, uh, your regular student lifecycle management, like class scheduling, grading, and assessments. We have an integrated, learning management system, which enables you to you know, um, upload online content 
uh, which includes um, you know, adaptive learning as well. So once uh, the student is, is, um, is part of doing that deg degree or any, any kind of uh, course they're doing, we have a degree audit module uh, where you can track student uh, progress throughout the degree. We also have financials and fee and invoicing modules that enables you to uh, manage the complete financial accountings. Um, and finally, the alumni platform, uh, which enables you to um, uh, engage uh, alumni students. So we have a we have a, a, a modular approach to education management. So that means that customers can pick and choose the modules they need, and they only pay for those modules as well. So have a various list of modules, in, including integrations to external third-party applications. We have over 100 plus integrations, including integrations to um, uh, legacy platforms and and also enterprise platforms like uh, Google uh, Google Google Apps or Google uh, G Station, as well as Office 365. So thanks to our comprehensive solution that we provide, our extensive customer base includes not only schools, colleges, and academic um, um, academic trainings, training institutions, but also uh, we have not-for-profit uh, institutions, uh, multinational companies, as well as global, um, uh, as well as government bodies as well. So here is a list of our customers, including some of the customers in China. So we, one of our key marquee customers in China is PwC, PricewaterhouseCoopers. Uh, including some of the uh, accounts that we have is U.S. Department of Defense, Johns Hopkins University, um, and quite a few. And, and in that list, you will see that, you know, it starts from K to 12 up until, you know, large universities as well. So 2020 has been a phenomenal year for us. So we've increased our customer base to 5,500 uh, uh, customers globally. We have an average of 4 million active students daily. And in the peak of the pandemic, we've grown, uh, grown up to 9 million active users daily. Uh, so we are in 130 countries. Um, and, and just a snapshot of the awards we've got recently in 2020, that includes you know, top 50 tech companies in ANZ, um, you know, 2020 Quality Choice Awards, including uh, the 2020 um, you know, top 20 education platforms. Uh, and then that's and fantastic you where class 365 is getting to that's a that's awesome it's just a great thing that you're doing so thank you very much uh, nadan for sharing the class 365 story with us and just a reminder that any delegates you can go and meet with any of the presenters in their trade booth so now we're going to move on we're going to welcome adam MacArthur from pascal press hi adam how's it going hi david I'm good and yourself good good we can hear you we can see you have you got some slides and we'll make sure we've got those as well all right, they should be um, just waiting. Yeah, now just, uh, All right, we've got your slides. You might want to go full screen there as well. There we go. Perfect. All right, leave you to it, Adam. All right, thanks, David. So um, I'm Adam MacArthur from Blake uh, Education, Blake eLearning. Um, and what we're going to take you through is a short overview of our Reading Eggs brand and our product. And really what we're uh, about here is uh, engaging those are essential academic skills, particularly around literacy, English literacy and numeracy. So we've been going for 30 years and a really background in education publishing, um, you know, as well with you know, a range of books, videos, websites um, that we've had over that, uh, that time. So for us, it's a bit of a snapshot of our business. Um, our head office is in Sydney, you know, but also have an office in the US, UK, and in Shanghai and Beijing. And our program is locally hosted in China. And so we've made an investment um, you know, to make sure our product is available in China. Um, and now this is really the start of us. Uh, it's ramping up that um, exposure. We have partners in many locations around the world um, who work with us to expand uh, the Reading X product uh, across the world. So really, when we look at um, the instructional design of what our program is about, it incorporates reading eggs, reading eggs, express and math seeds, and they're built around these five features of comprehensive learning, being aligned to all associated standards, combining that explicit instruction um, to really make, you know, under, uh, to allow students to learn, um, you know, these core skills. You know, they have individual learning pathways and really high level of student engagement. So we make that investment in our content, the look and feel, the design of the program, you know, all of those er um, elements of the program to, to improve, um, you know, student achievement. 
So when you look at our program, this is really what it is in today's four components. Um, so we've got a junior program, which is really around those early years, ages two to four, which is those basic skills around the alphabet um, and learning to read skills. The core of our program is the reading eggs, which really targeted around uh, ages three to seven and follow this structured learning path um, that I'll talk a bit more about, um, which goes around phonics, sight words and reading skills. And then for those, as we get in those older years, you know, and building confidence in our reading eggs express product. Uh, which is ages 7 to 13. And so this is really the core of our program is around, you know, those core literacy skills for, you know, primary school and early high school years. We've also got a maths program that sits alongside that. Um, you know, we saw as part of our uh, understanding is not only having those great literacy um, tools, but also maths products, uh, math program as well, and built in the same style as Reading X. You know, this is to give you, a, you know, an understanding of the visual approach of our program. You know, it's followed these paths, and so we've got these maps. So students have to complete each step um, as they go along, and again, it's part of that personalised journey. Um, you know, they go and are placed at various locations based on their capability. And while this is a, you know, um, a digital program, we also have a real uh, strong heritage in printed materials. And we know, it's, you know, in for both parents and teachers needing print materials to support that learning process, not only just having a pure digital program. But one of our things we're most proud of recently is the launch of our Fast Phonics program. And this is something, you know, that sits alongside that learning to read and that deep, um, you know, the importance of phonics has been increasing over the last few years. And, and it's important to have that separate activity around the phonics, which is what we've added to the program. We also have received many awards uh, for our programs, you know, across the years. You know, certification by various education groups and particularly proud of this education alliance in Finland um, about the pedagogical quality of our program and that's you know again that investment we've made over these last 30 years but also just to leave you with our, our program is really well used in the school market and so while the majority of our usage is in the US UK and Australia in those schools we have over 15,000 schools subscribed with 2 million students um, showing the range and scale of our program and its usage across the world we're also um, significant in the consumer market, so telling the parents where they want to do something you know, with their child at home. And again, you can see there's some of the numbers here with over 500,000 new registered users, 8 million um, all-time registered students. So we've got this you know, significant um, you know, range of the program that's been used across both the schools and consumer market. So that's all I was going to go through today as a quick overview. I uh, certainly hope you can join myself and my colleague uh, in later on in our uh, trade booth. But um, now, David, um, now that's the, uh, the summary of where we are with, uh, um, with reading X. Fantastic, Adam. It's really great to again hear sort of how you guys are taking on the world and going into China as well, which is really exciting. So yes, as Adam mentioned, you can go and meet, meet with any of the presenters in the trade booth. So now we're going to move on. We've got Darcy Jamison from Matific. Are you with us, Darcy? Can't see you just yet, Darcy. Oh, there we go. We've now got you and we'll get you to share your slides and we'll just get them up on screen. And I'll let you know. So can you just say hello and make sure we can hear you? Hi, everyone. Thanks for having Perfect. me. We can hear you. Let's see your slides. Just waiting for the producer to put the slides up on the screen. Fantastic. All right. So we've got your slides. We've got you. All right. Thanks, Darcy. Off you go. Hi everyone, thank you so much for having me. Good morning to our friends in China. My name's Darcy. I'm the Director of Global Partnerships for Matific. Um, what is Matific? Um, so we're a math program for K to six and we work across the globe and at our heart and at our vision is to ensure every child in every country is given the best possible mathematical experience. And it's really important that we are giving each child that mathematical experience because we actually have a real issue in the way we teach STEM. And when we talk about STEM, we think about all the scientists and programmers and engineers that, are, that we're going to need for the next century. But a lot of the time what we're seeing is maybe two people out of that class are gonna get through secondary and tertiary education. And so we have schools and governments and they're investing in STEM. They're putting all this money in, but a lot of the time they forget about the M. But without maths, the science, the technology, the engineering, the coding, it all f lies on that math. So we end up with nothing. So for Matific, 
we like to think of ourselves as putting the M in STEM. We look at teaching around the world, and the reason Matific was started was by our founders, who are a couple of academics, um, mathematicians and pedagogy experts. Um, and they were seeing people come to universities without the requisite math skills. And they looked at how mathematics had been taught. And they saw it and they realized they were being taught the same way as they were taught. I know when I was at school, this is how I was taught mathematics. And then there's lots of digital products out there that teach maths. But a lot of the time, it's just putting those sums on a screen with some nice colors and perhaps a couple of graphics. But it wasn't revolutionary. It was hardly evolutionary. And so we were seeing this poor performance in children. Number one, most primary school teachers, they're generalists. They went to university and studied teaching. They're not mathematicians. So what happened was rather than actually teaching the fundamental concepts, they focus on procedure. And when students aren't given the conceptual understanding needed to develop the links between the different topics in mathematics and how it relates to the rest of the world, they were unable to go on to the more complex areas of mathematics. Think algebraic reasoning, think calculus. We saw students get math anxiety and abstain from going into the STEM fields at all. So by the time they're in tertiary education, they're not studying maths at all. How often do you hear someone say, I'm just not a maths person? So that's why we have Matific. We've developed from the ground up a digital math learning resource for primary school students that combines thousands of adaptive gamified activities that are curriculum aligned with a rigorous pedagogy that places conceptual understanding at its heart. We want to ensure that students definitely have that fundamental concepts, the building blocks of mathematics in early years. So by the time they get to higher education, they're able to move forward confidently. And more importantly, they're engaged with mathematics because mathematics does not just live in a silo but it is fundamental to the way we engage with our world. We enable students to really meet that mathematical challenge. We do it by engaging them with gamified activities that don't just give you points, but each activity that we've created, and there's thousands of them, intrinsically engage students with immersive story-based activities. We impact learning with a rigorous pedagogy that in a study done by the University of Western Sydney raised scores by 34%. And we make teachers able to focus on what matters, teaching, by automating the tool administrative tasks that take them away from their core focus. Darcy, thanks so very much for giving us a quick introduction to Matific. That uh, gives us a great opportunity to understand a little bit about what Matific is and how you're impacting learners around the world. So thank you so very much for uh, showcasing. And again, you'll have a booth over in the expo hall so that you can uh, answer any questions that people might have. And finally, we move on to our last presenter this morning before we get to our keynote, which is Peter Wong from Ubria. Hi, Peter. How's it going? Hello, David. Thank you, David. Hello. Hear you, which is fantastic. And I think you've got some slides. So let's get your slides up. Okay, so we can hear you, we can see you, and we've got your slides. So off you go. Fantastic. Um, okay, hello, and thanks everyone for having me. My name is Peter Wen. I'm the CEO and founder of Ubril, it's the comprehensive online music education system. The Ubril system consists of three key areas of music learning. Online lessons via the Ubril app, online examinations through Ubril, uh, through Cumbria examinations and Ubril International Music Festival. Um, I believe this is the old slide. Uh, do you have the, the latest one? Uh, sorry, uh, yep. That's what we've got, Peter. So you can, uh, you can, you, we, we can't change it now. Sorry. Uh, okay. Okay. Sure. Sure. Then we just uh, move on. Yep. Um, okay. Sure. The Uber app isn't. Okay. Can we move on to the next page? 
Yep. And the next page, thank you. The Uber app is an all-rounded professional teaching platform which provides the latest online lessons technology with HD video call and high definition audio. Uh, you may scan the QR code on the top right to download and experience Uber app. We'll move down. So, and down the next one. Uh, Uber connects teachers and students from around the world. We're able to deliver high quality online lessons for students in China to learn from teachers worldwide, as well as teachers in China now may teach students internationally. Um, Uber has experienced teachers from the earliest level of instrumental learning all the way to professors of, from global conservatory. Uber features interactive smart board, which allows teachers to load lesson materials and annotate them in real time. And a comprehensive lesson booking system. It supports multiple angle and devices during lesson, as well as stickers and animated GIF to boost kids' no motivation during class. Moving on, next we have our online music exam system. Cumbria Examinations is an online music exam system which uses pre-recorded video performance of candidates to assess the candidate's true ability. You can enroll CBE at any time and from anywhere, and you can download a copy of the Cumbria Exams brochure by scanning the QR code on the bottom right of the screen. Moving on, and think of Cumbria Exams like the IELTS testing system for music. Cumbria Exams is used in over 50 countries. It is supported by the Australian government as well as the Chinese Department of Education. It is recognized by leading universities such as the University of Sydney. Cumbria Examinations Board consists of some of the most distinguished musicians and educators from around the world. Cumbria Exams can even offer letter of reference and master classes by the Uber app to further assist students who wish to study music professionally. Moving on. Next, we have um, this very exciting offline event which we organize for our candidates every year, the Uber International Music Festival. Next page, thank you. The Uber International Music Festival is a two weeks event where we bring together students from China and other parts of the world to our hometown in Sydney. Here, they will have their opening ceremony at the Sydney Conservatorium of Music, participate in master classes by our highly esteemed musicians, tour Sydney, and most importantly, all students will perform at the prestigious Sydney Opera House, uh, as well as receiving their award of achievement. This has been very well received in the past, and we have had over thousands of students joining this program every year. So we hope to host this either online or offline towards the winter holiday of 2021. Next, thank you. Uh, so thank you all for watching today. So this is um, one of our um, most outstanding candidates, yep, uh, Christian Lee, yep, and who has just won the biggest international violin competition as a part of um, a proud user of Ubro. Yep. Sure. Yep. So Thanks very much, Peter. Uh, that's the next that's, page. We'll that's just... a great introduction to the Ubrio product. I really appreciate you sharing that with us. So um, that's just awesome. We're now going to say thank you very much. And again, just for everyone, all of our presenters will be in a um, in their trade booths, which you can go and meet in a moment. And that gives us a great introduction to those seven New South Wales EdTech companies. And now we get to move into our plenary session. Australia has a global reputation for leading education practice, which is built upon true thought leadership and grand visions. Today, we have one of those visionaries with us. Please welcome Professor Shirley Alexander, the Deputy Vice Chancellor of Education at University of Technology, Sydney. Hi, Professor Alexander, how are you? Hi, very well, thanks, David. Allow me to do a formal introduction to you. Um, in a moment, Professor Alexander will be joined by Mr. Adam Brimmer, who's the group CEO of Open Learning and one of Australia's leading ed tech entrepreneurs. But allow me to introduce Professor Alexander first. Professor Alexander's career is focused on effective use of technologies in K-12 schools and higher education settings. She's been a member of three successive national government committees advising on improvements in higher education, teaching and learning. She was the chair of the Digital Education Advisory Group Committee reporting to the Federal Minister of the School Education. At UTS, Professor Alexander is responsible for leading key priorities in teaching and learning, the student experience and development of a strong student culture across the university. Shirley has led major campus redevelopment in UTS to ensure that learning spaces are designed for the future of education, whilst leading strategic projects around learning futures and new micro-credentials and short courses. I think you've got some slides to share there as well, is that right, Professor? I do. Are they 
showing now? Uh, we're going to get them in a second. Yep, we've got them. All right, so I'll hand over to you and we'll um, come back with any timings. If not, you'll, you'll, Adam will come back in when you're finished and we'll have a Q&A. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, so thank you, everyone, for joining this session today. Um, I'm just back from leave two days ago. Even though I was only away for a couple of weeks, it felt like a couple of years. But um, as I'm very, very excited to be able to talk to you about the way I see higher education changing in a post-COVID world. And um, I, do I do think that we are going to see um, even more change than we we have, have previously thought about. So I'm just going to talk about that today. So um, my agenda today is just to give you a, a brief overview of a timeline of change in learning and teaching at UTS. Talk about the framework that we've used to make decisions. Then talk a bit about the way I think COVID is going to change our context and then show you the two, the two iterations of our learning and teaching strategy. So sometimes when people talk about uh, strategy, it's something that's fairly new um, and has been developed quite recently. But if you look at our timeline here, this is something that we've been working on for 10 years. So it probably all started um, around the year 2000 when we looked at spending a billion dollars on a campus redevelopment. And so I was very concerned to make sure that we in spending that money, we were building a campus for the future of learning rather than the past. And so we spent a lot of time thinking about what, what learning should look like and designing the buildings accordingly. Um, then in 2012, I came up with what turned out to be an error in retrospect, um, a name for the strategy, and I called it Learning 2014. It's, it's called learning because I wanted to focus on learning as opposed to teaching. So what do students need to do in order to learn and therefore how do we design teaching? And I appended the 2014 because that was the year we were moving into the first of the buildings. Um, in retrospect, it was a mistake because we did um, move into some of the buildings in 2014, but when we got to 2015, um, we couldn't be doing Learning 2014. So I changed the name to Learning Futures. Um, but we also started to do extensive peer review of what we're doing. In 2018, we, um, on top of our Learning Futures strategy, implemented a new project to, to review our courses in a very systematic way. Unfortunately, I don't have time to talk about that today. Then of course, we came to 2020 with COVID and now I've come up with another version, which is Learning Futures version two. So just to show you quickly what happened with the campus redevelopment, these were the first buildings that were finished in 2014. Um, and then we've gone on to, to develop some more facilities. And most people talk about the buildings here, but to me, the, the most important thing is what's going on inside those buildings. Um, what kind of learning are students engaged in? So very early on um, in the year 2000, I developed this framework for making decisions about what we do in learning and teaching. Starting with who are our students? What do we know about them? And what are their needs? Then using that to help inform the development of our curriculum. So we had a, a curriculum working group here looking at, given these students, what, what do we want students to learn and, and how? And then that curriculum informed the technologies that we need. So what technologies do we need to support this kind of learning and these students? And then finally, what kind of learning spaces are needed to support this curriculum? So it's really the students, then what is the curriculum, then the technologies, and then the learning spaces. So what was really interesting was looking at um, how, how students view um, different aspects of their learning. And we at UTS have 
uh, people counters, so we can always tell how many people are in a room. And when we looked at the standard attendance at lectures, you can see each week, this must be very disheartening, this is the average attendance at lectures, um, whereas the attendance is much higher for other forms of learning. So it's starting to look as though lectures were not something that students thought were important enough to devote their time to. And I was always very amused by this article in Campus Review that showed this poor academic at another university turning up to give his class and not a single student was in attendance because they were being recorded. Um, and so I think the even though we've been talking about this for some time, the days of the stand and deliver lecture are well and truly over in a classroom. Um, so we also were looking at what is the future um, in terms of what, what kind of um, institution we are. We're a university of technology and what does that mean? So we developed uh, the UTS model of learning which is really about what students learn, how we design our courses. So it's designed around three major aspects. So it's practice oriented learning. So we are, we're really about um, making sure that what students are learning is going to be um, aligned very closely to, to the practices they will be engaged in when they're in industry. We're preparing them for a global workplace and learning is research inspired and research integrated. So people often talk about the content of learning um, in terms of dot points of subject content, but they often forget that what's also important are particular skills for learning. And in looking at, at the future of work, we could see a whole range of skills that were needed um, for students to succeed in, in the future workplace. So digital literacy is incredibly important, problem solving skills, the ability to work across disciplines, interpersonal skills. They're just some of the skills that we know that we, know that we have to embed in every aspect of student learning. And we also have to be able to support entrepreneurial mindsets. Um, in a survey a couple of years ago, we were surprised to find that 40% of our students didn't want a traditional job. They wanted to create their own jobs and ventures. And that's why scaling up student entrepreneurship is such a key part of our approach. And you can see there a range of ways in which we've been doing that. Um, and we have a, a very um, comprehensive startup program that students are able to become engaged in. So that then all led to um, Learning Futures version one. And I've got a link to, to this if you'd like to find out more information about it. But the basic idea was that students come in to learning with particular goals and they have to be able to access ideas and content. But what we are saying is there are a myriad of ways in which students can do that. There, um, there are apps, there's YouTube, there's TED, TED uh, there's computer-based learning, there are um, um, e-books, there are uh, digital libraries and so on. And we wanted students to have an opportunity to access those ideas and content before they come onto campus. And then they're working with others in groups and teams because we know that learning is very social. But once they're on campus, they're actively engaged in activities that help them to make sense of what they're learning, testing out ideas and taking action. And then the next phase is receiving feedback. Action without feedback is a terrible learning experience. Um, and so we know that students really, really value high quality feedback on their learning. But then they need opportunities to reflect on what their goals were, what they learned, 
how they put that into practice and what the feedback was and how they should change their understanding. So then um, along came COVID and we had to move everything online. And as we start to look at coming back onto campus, um, it caused everyone to, to really rethink um, how, we, how we design learning in the future. So the context in which we're working, I really think that we are going to have to spend a lot of time thinking about how we're going to reduce the cost of education because we're just not going to be able to afford to continue to, pro to provide learning opportunities in the ways that we have before. Um, and students are going to be demanding, um, I imagine, um, more links to, um, to job opportunities as the job market tightens. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about um, where I see um, student learning from this year on, and I'm calling this Learning Futures version two. So there's been um, a big shift in appreciation for online learning. Um, if I had tried to implement this a couple of years ago, I wouldn't have been successful because by and large students and some, some students and some staff didn't think that learning online um, was as effective. But in our last semester, we had the highest student evaluation scores that we have ever had and the students were 90% online. Um, so now we have to make sure that we don't lose the gains that we've made. Um, and so then what's important for us is to figure out what we do online and what we do face to face. So in, in designing my, our new strategy, um, I've divided it into three aspects. Um, orientation is often something that's mentioned in passing, but it's a very critical part of the student learning experience. Then I'm going to talk about learning and then about reflection. So um, the key theme that is running through the whole of this new strategy is employability and employment. And I know that is going to be contested because there are many people who think that a university education shouldn't be about training people for the workforce. Um, but my argument about that is that we, we are teaching people to be really critical thinkers as part of preparing them for the workforce. And that's not what I would call job training. It's preparing them for life to become a critical thinker. Um, so we're going to focus our orientation on first year transition because for many people coming to university is a real shock. Um, I've got a, a grandson who's in high school who's overjoyed to hear that he doesn't have to come to classes when he's at university, but he doesn't quite realise that with that freedom comes a lot of, um, of time management skills. So there's a lot that we need to do to help students understand the difference between school for those who are coming straight from school and university. And so instead of taking students on endless campus tours, we're going to actually get them involved in a small, slightly complex project where they start to build their understanding of the importance of the graduate attributes, such as being able to work in teams, um, being able to communicate with others and so on, and to begin to plan for their, their UTS experience. What we're hoping is that um, it, it motivates them to continue to learn and builds a sense of belonging. Um, we also need them to understand their own agency in learning. I'm still surprised at the number of students who come in and think that they're going to sit passively in a class and while the teacher talks and that magically will result in learning and we all know that it doesn't. So we need them to start to build a sense of agency in learning and to set their goals. We're going to take them through an exercise where they design their UTS. 
So there are so many opportunities for students um, at university now. I'd love to be starting over again. There are clubs, societies, um, projects, um, opportunities to travel abroad when everything opens up again and so on. So we want to get them to start to, to design their UTS. So the next phase is learning. And once again, um, we need students to be able to access the content of learning. And so the way that we're going to approach this is in, in two different directions. One is we're going to be looking a lot more at third party content. Um, and I think I might have just come in at the tail end of someone talking about OER, I might be wrong, but um, open education resources. It's, um, it's still a mystery to me why um, it's, these open education resources have been so slow to gain traction. Um, when people are quite used to, if they don't know how to do something, they're quite happy to go to YouTube and look at a five minute video. I use it all the time. Um, but we haven't got the same traction with OERs. Um, there are a lot of publishers who are producing content and of course, OPX providers. But I think there are going to be big opportunities for us to not reinvent the wheel every time we run a particular subject, every semester, every year. We just will not have the resources to do it. But we also have a lot of in-house content that has been developed. And so what we need and what we're looking at building is a digital asset repository so that we have um, big resource of tagged video, audio, animation, text, and so on. Now, all of that will be done online. But what comes next is the active learning component. And we want to have a, a much bigger focus on work integrated learning, where we're partnering with industry using a range of approaches and strategies that integrate theory um, with the actual practice of work with a purposefully designed curriculum. Um, ideally, we'd have industry engagement in every single subject um, and active engagement with the professional roles that our students will be going out, out to do. Um, so that is the really key on campus um, component. And then assessment. I mentioned earlier that students really value um, as much feedback as they can get. Yet when we ask academics what they like the least about teaching, 90% of them will say marking. And so what can we do about that so that it reduces um, the time that academics need to spend on feedback, but increases the quality of feedback. Now, if we do this work integrated learning with industry well, students will be getting really good feedback from industry. We've also started using um, analytics, learning analytics, to provide students with automated feedback. And we have a program called AccuWriter that's been developed here where students can submit a piece of writing as many times as they wish and received automated feedback on the way it's structured. So is there a clear introduction? Um, and it depends on the kind of piece of writing. There are different versions for different pieces of writing where they continue to get feedback until the student is happy um, that they've got the best version um, of their piece of writing they can and then it's submitted to the academic for feedback. Um, so we're looking at more ways of automating feedback and getting industry feedback. And then finally, there's the period of, of reflection. Um, what were the goals of action, feed, what feedback and the plan revision. So it's still similar to uh, version one of Learning Futures, but it's really with a post COVID world um, uh, in embedded a major focus on work integrated learning. And this, I think, is going to be 
um, the most important thing that, that higher education does, provide those active learning experiences. If, if a learner is only after what they see as content, then there are hundreds of cheaper ways of gaining access to that without going through a university education. But you do get a much deeper understanding of what it is that you're trying to learn by trying to do something authentic with it and then getting authentic feedback. So how might we go, what, what's the detail about how we might go about this? So um, we've got an academic in uh, accounting and she has created her own YouTube channel called Amanda Loves to Audit. And as you can see here, um, she has 43,000 subscribers and she told me recently that she's up to 2 million downloads of her pieces of work. So she's got just so many videos um, about different aspects of auditing. And as you can see, 123,000 views. So her work is being used. So why is it that we find OERs so difficult to implement and um, and and use. I think um, awareness of OER and the Creative Commons is growing, but it's growing very slowly because the existing OER repositories are relatively unused um, compared with things like YouTube, Khan Academy, and so on. So that's an area of great opportunity, I think, for us to do more work on. Um, because we're not going to get the cost savings unless we start sharing resources. Um, a lot of people say to me, well, I'm not really sure how to engage my students in active and collaborative learning. So here's just a, here's just a list of some of the different kinds of active and collaborative learning approaches um, that we're using at UTS. So what are the technologies that we are going to need in order to, to implement this kind of strategy? Well, we're going to need really good tools for reflection. Um, so so uh, many, many people talk about e-portfolio tools and so on, and we, we have been using a range of those, but I think there's a lot more that we could do um, with tools for reflection. The learning content aspect I've already mentioned um, and I think anything that we can do to try and improve um, opportunities for staff to, to develop content that's really good, maybe have it peer reviewed and publicise it so that others can use it um, will be something that is incredibly valuable. Tools for collaboration, if we're going to make this work well. We need tools to, to manage group work. We need um, software that makes it easy for teams to store and annotate text, video, arrange meetings, send messages and so on. And of course, self and peer assessment of group work. Um, an academic who was at UTS developed a program called Spark um, as a direct outcome of one of the working groups from that framework I showed earlier. Um, where students um, at the start of a group work project decide what each of the tasks are and who is going to do each one of them. At the end of the group work project, they give each other a self assessment and a peer assessment of their contribution to that teamwork. So they're the kinds of tools that we'll need. And we'll also be needing uh, as many tools as we can get to provide automated feedback. And so what does all that mean for learning spaces? Well, I'm really proud to say that in the $1 billion project, we haven't built a single standard lecture theatre. These are the kinds of learning spaces that we have built. And I'll just finish by giving you um, some examples of the ways in which these spaces are being used using these, um, these active learning strategies. Um, and these are just some quotes from students. This was a project where they worked with Google. Students really love being able to work on real world problems. 
Um, so the next one is um, a hackathon, an example of a hackathon in the large room. Um, I mentioned working with industry um, and we do a lot of that. In fact, one of our courses, the BCII, has a waiting list of industry who want our students to work on their projects. Um, the Governor of New South Wales um, was one of our industry engagement projects in helping him to manage his diary. Um, so look, learning now doesn't look anything like the images you see of the 50s of um, people sitting in large lecture theatres while the teacher out the front writes up in, in chalk. Um, students are really actively engaged. This obviously is a pre-COVID um, image. So all of that hinges on us being, um, being connected with industry um, and we are already involved with over 150 companies um, and we're able to, to offer them access to students. We take a transdisciplinary approach. We've got terrific infrastructure um, and the, the feedback from industry has been incredibly positive. So here's just a couple of references. Um, if you would like to, to have a look at some of these a bit more and I'll finish there and take any questions. Fantastic, thank you very much, Shirley. We've got um, Adam Brimo, the group CEO of Open Learning, who's gonna join us. Now oh, here's Adam and I'll, I'll leave you guys to have a conversation and we'll feed questions from the audience across for you as well if we get in the okay? Thanks, David. Thanks, Shirley. That was a wonderful presentation. Um, I think it gives everyone a really good idea of um, where the university is going and some of the experiences that have led up to that. So um, I think I'll just open it up to a few questions now. I've just got a few after um, watching the presentation. So just drilling into a few things um, that you covered. And I mean, I, I think I really like the um, renaming of it. I think if it was Learning 2014, then um, might not be as uh, exciting today. Yeah. But, but one thing I did see was um, a focus on OER, which um, I thought was, was quite exciting and interesting. Um, but also, you know, a little bit, um, I think bring, bringing back some of the experiences we've probably had for, for many years with OER, because OER has been around for a while and I think different universities have tried to use it in different ways. So um, what have we learned from the implementations of OER sort of over the past, you know, maybe even 10 or 20 years and what can we do differently with it today? Um, and how do you think students will respond to, to those kinds of materials? Mm. So I might start with how will students respond. Um, one of our big challenges in using OERs is students' perception of what they're paying for. Um, because an, an academic could spend, let's just say, for example, an hour in creating a lecture and stand up and give that lecture. And it's fairly easy to do because they're a subject matter expert. They love getting up and in front of an audience, um, you can show off what you know. I personally love giving lectures too. Um, and students don't unfortunately learn as much from that as we would like. Um, or a, a staff member might spend 10 hours really um, getting a good understanding of how students come to understand a particular topic and looking for a range of open education resources that they can um, put together as a curated learning experience for students. But the problem is that students by and large will value the one hour lecture from an academic more then they will value a set of really well curated resources that they can step through. So the, our, our big challenge is the perception from students of what it is that they're paying for, which is why I've got such a focus on the active learning aspect, because it's, not, it's what can you do with what you know that's important. Um, so, so that's one of our, our challenges. Um, the other challenge is how people can go about finding these OERs and, um, and making judgments about them. So that's where I think there are big opportunities for, um, for companies to, to be 
working alongside universities to try and make these um, much more acceptable approach to learning. Yeah, I think I think that's fascinating, and um, I agree with this this challenge around the perception of why you're coming to a university or yeah. even what a learning experience is. Yeah. Um, yeah, you only value what's in front of you. You don't really see the work that went into it to get there. And and hence our um, it hence it, at my change to orientation to try and help students understand who does the learning, where um, where they're saying unless someone is is standing in front of me talking, um, then I'm not really getting what I paid for, and. Um, so what, what they don't see is that teaching is a designing experience. It's not a performance experience. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I think that focus on learning design is, is quite critical. Um, yeah. And in many ways, you spend more time up front doing learning design, but you might spend less time, you know, in front of the students, but the students will get a better experience yeah. uh, out of it at the end. Um, yeah. Now, I guess one thing that we hope is that, you know, maybe perceptions will change. Um, over time and maybe the past year has helped move that along. Um, I don't think we're going to have the luxury of time to wait for that and hope it just happens organically. Um, and so one of the things I'm going to be doing this year is looking at how we can really shift that. It's not impossible and that's why I'm so interested in Amanda White's um, YouTube clips on, on audit because clearly people see that as an acceptable way of, of learning. So how can we build on what's good about that? Yeah, I think that there has been a big um, move towards some uh, educators and academics sharing um, their lectures and their knowledge and tutorials online. Um, I know that was how Open Learning actually started uh, back in the day originally, number yeah. of online lectures. Mm -hmm. So um, one area where I'm hopeful that, that we will see a lot of traction in this is around developing those entrepreneurial skills um, and yeah. I really like the emphasis that you made on these entrepreneurial and startup culture at UTS because uh, I think you know UTS certainly um, is quite well known for its startup community, uh, and I imagine that would attract a lot of people to the university. So mm -hmm. I, I wonder to what extent do you see this learning future strategy uh, driving or supporting that kind of culture um, at the university, and, and maybe that will help push the adoption of these approaches. Yes, yeah, so um, students can um, apply to to start um, an organisation or, or to, to go down to our startups area um, just as part of their course. So they can take a subject and so on as well. Um, and we also have a transdisciplinary faculty um, with our um, quite well-known Bachelor of Creative Intelligence and Innovation that includes entrepreneurship. And um, we're now opening those up to um, as electives for all students with a view to making them compulsory in the future. I see some questions flashing across the screen. Should I be answering those as they Yeah, I, I saw those though, it was very fast. Um, but I, th I think touching on that, actually, um, you know, the Bachelor of Creative Intelligence, I think, is a quite a remarkable program. Um, and I would just add sort of some of our uh, personal experience with it, which is that uh, at Open Learning, we actually had an intern join us uh, a few years ago who was undertaking that program. Um, and they had fantastic things to say about it. And yeah. I remember after learning about the structure, I was wondering why there weren't more programs like that. Yeah, it's, um, it's not easy. It's, um, it's a program that I started quite a few years ago and it was quite challenging to persuade people um, that there was a need for a transdisciplinary approach. Um, I think sometimes faculty saw it as um, cutting a, across what they do. But what I've been at pains to explain is that we need depth in disciplines in order to be able to have the transdisciplinary approaches. Mm, yeah. So, I mean, to deliver this strategy, I guess, there's a lot of different components. Um, so I'm wondering if you're able to share a bit about how you see collaboration occurring um, between the university and maybe between educational technology companies and education, the education uh, industry in general. Because uh, I think there's a lot of interesting areas that 
you're trying to deliver on. And I imagine the university would not be able to you know, develop all of these things internally. That's right. So I won't be able to achieve what I'm trying to achieve without those technologies that I showed. Um, but what, what I've tried to do is say, this is what we need for our students and for the curriculum, rather than having companies coming, you know, I get emails several times a day from companies saying, you've got to try out what we're offering. Um, <laughs> Um, but what I'd really love is an opportunity where I can say to organisations, this is what we need. What can you do for us? Can we work together on this? Mm. Um, and I've, I, I just identified those four areas as um, a starting point. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that's, that's a good opportunity. I saw a number there as well that I'm sure everyone can go back to um, from sort of OER to, um, you know, uh, the active learning, authentic assessment. Um, yeah. A lot of different technologies. I think yeah. that's quite exciting. Um, so, so one area I want to touch on as well is around the increasing demand for upskilling and reskilling um, that we're seeing across um, yeah. Australia and around the world at the moment. Now, you know, as short courses and micro credentials become more popular, uh, and some of the, the online resources, even those lectures that that you showed, become um, you know more popular for for people to develop their skills. Um, I imagine people will start looking towards. Uh, industry or university for some kind of validation uh, of people's uh, skills as well. So I'm just wondering if you could share briefly what role do you see the university playing uh, in this new world for short courses, micro credentials, mm -hmm. uh, and non accredited education generally? Yeah. Um, so there, there was a time when universities um, didn't really value something that was developed elsewhere. So a student may have done, um, and this happened to me as well, I started my degree at a different university and I did a year um, and then I went to another university and tried to get credit for that and they only gave me one subject credit. Um, those days I have to change. Um, I don't think we can afford to um, be setting up those rings, those barriers anymore and, uh, and I think I'm seeing um, a lot of evidence of that changing. So we have a number of master's degrees, for example, that now accept portfolios and other short courses and so on. So that area is undergoing um, quite significant change at the moment. It has to. Mm. Mm. I might have to actually jump in there and say thank you so very much. It's been a great conversation. I can see that you both were uh, both engaged and you might go another 15 or 20 minutes, but we are starting to run out of time. So what I wanted to do is say thank you so very much, Professor Alexander, giving us an insight to where UTS has been and Adam for facilitating our Q&A. So thank you very much. Thank, thank you very you. much. Okay, bye. Um, the thank you. And so with that, that sort of starts to bring us towards the end of today and so we have Andrew Carter from um, Austrade who's the Trade Commissioner for Education in the Greater China Region and Andrew's with us. I saw Andrew now he's gone yes, away. Thank you, Hi David. Andrew how are you? Good David thank you and uh, good morning and good afternoon everyone wherever you happen to be. It's a pleasure to be here with you virtually for this Global Summit Series event hosted by the New South Wales Government and EduGrowth. I'm Andrew Carter, I'm Austrade's Trade Commissioner for Education in, in Greater China. Um, I think we can all agree that the edtech sector is a really exciting space, leveraging digital technologies and innovation to enhance technology, uh, to enhance teaching and learning. Undoubtedly, 2020 was a challenging year and these challenges are still with us. Um, but one observation we can make is, um, and as we heard today, during this disruptive period, uh, existing technology trends really accelerated. When COVID forced schools to go remote, we saw educators and students become more reliant on technology than ever before. Australia is recognised for its high quality, globally relevant education and training systems, and these credentials reinforce our edtech capability. We had a, a, a great program today that showcased Australian edtech capabilities with a group of truly innovative companies, and I would encourage you all to visit the trade booths and connect with them. Um, Aussie EdTech companies are solving problems and adding value right across the education spectrum from early childhood to university and technical education. Um, I also wanted to thank Professor Alexander for a really engaging session. There's a lot of food for thought in there about 
learning design and the student experience. And I think hearing how UTS has reimagined that student experience in light of emerging needs and global trends is a reminder of the need to adapt and change to stay ahead of the curve. We can be confident that the demand for innovative learning technologies is only going to continue to grow in China. And Australian ed tech companies are enthusiastic about the potential that comes from partnering, connecting and growing together. So uh, with that, I'd just like to say thank you to the teams at Global New South Wales and EduGrowth for delivering today's event. And finally, thank you to the guests that attended today. Your presence is essential to our goal of helping connect learners and educators with innovative education solutions. Thank you. Thanks very much, Andrew. Really appreciate you providing that close for us. And um, that sort of brings us towards the end of our global summit, which we are doing today. So I'd like to thank everybody who tuned in today and come along and heard from our seven innovative ed tech companies and also to hear Professor Alexander's keynote about how they've driven change at UTS. I will remind, I think Andrew did it as well, I'll remind you that those seven companies will have a space over in the Expo Hall. You can go and meet with any of those individuals who presented today to ensure that you get a bit of understanding of how they can deliver their edtech solution to your institution, both here and in China and anywhere else around the world where you are coming from. I'd like to thank New South Wales Treasury for their support in partnering with us to bring this incredibly important event to life today. We also had some other partners who helped us promote this event across various regions around the world. Alibaba Cloud, FutureLearn and JMD EDU. We really appreciate your support and thanks for everyone to come in to, to come along to this event. So thank you again for, for um, uh, participating today and we'll see you at our next summit in a few months time. Thank you.